I want to start off with a land acknowledgement and say that uh, Queens is situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live there and play on these lands. I encourage all of us to be caretakers for the next generation. Uh, it is my uh, privilege today to introduce Dr. Lisa Butler, uh, who is going to be speaking on food insecurity, HIV, and child health, nutrition, and development in Western Kenya, uh, results of a cluster randomized controlled trial. Uh, uh, Dr. Butler is a new faculty member of Public Health Sciences, full professor in our department, uh, and she is a behavioral scientist and epidemiologist whose research, research focuses on the design, implementation, and evaluation of novel behavioral structural and biomedical interventions to improve the health of populations in communities that have historically been disadvantaged and marginalized. Uh, she has over 20 years research experience in countries throughout Africa and North America, including studies focused on HIV prevention and treatment, maternal child health, and vaccine and decision, vaccine decision making. Her research approach emphasizes mixed methods, transdisciplinary collaboration, program and community partnerships, uh, community engagement, and design thinking strategies. She's going to make a tremendous contribution to our department. We are extremely privileged to have her as a member of Public Health Sciences. Please help me welcome Dr. Lisa Bach. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here, inviting me to, to this talk. This, um, and I understand it's your last seminar. I'm super excited to be here here at Queens here with you today. Department. I've met only a few of you. I can't wait to meet all of you. Um, so, uh, and it's I'm super to see faculty and students here and online. Um, um, so I, I thought, you know, I, I gave a title as I was asked to do a few weeks ago. <laughs> And I was pretty busy dealing with everything moving between, um, I was coming from University of Connecticut to here, and I finally just gave it a, a title. But I've thought since I'm new here, and, um, and for many of us, it's our first meeting, I thought I would just begin by telling you a little bit about my background and my research interests, um, in part because I really see this as the start of a conversation. Um, I look forward to finding ways of connecting with you. and. Um, hopefully through the little bits and pieces that I show you today, you'll sort of maybe see yourself here and I look forward to talking to you. I'm involved with a lot of things which I am not an expert in and um, this is quite intimidating to me sometimes and you might see it in my voice, but here I am. Um, so we're going to tell you a little bit about myself. We're going to talk about the trial and then more about sort of future directions and opportunities. So to start, I think some of you have noted, I do indeed have two PhDs. Um, it was never intentional from the beginning <laughs> and I would not advise it. No one was going to hear that from me. Um, my first PhD was in educational psychology. Um, I trained under Jeffrey Sachs, um, who is not the Jeffrey Sachs that some of you might know in health, but, um, but or the economist, but rather a developmental psychologist. Um, he's now at, at University of California, Berkeley. Um, so I trained with Jeff Sachs, and I trained with Tom Weisner, who was at UCLA. Jeff was a developmental psychologist whose work focused on culture and cognitive development. Um, he specifically focused, focused on mathematical understanding, and he worked in a variety of settings in Papua New Guinea and Brazil and classrooms throughout the U.S. Um, Dr. Weisner is an anthropologist whose work is focused on culture and human development, um, and I was especially drawn to the work that he had done over many years, focused on caregivers and children in various settings in Africa. I did my own field work in rural areas in South Africa, and it was in the late 1990s, which was a really important time in the history of the country, um, as these were the very early days following the formation of the democratic government led by Nelson Mandela in 1994, signifying the end of apartheid. It was an incredibly important time for me. My voice cries. <laughs> um, in my own development. First, it was about you know, building on the work of 
Dr. Sachs and, and Weisner. Um, and, you know, I was finding ways of looking at, you know, these issues around social and cultural change and develop, on development on people's understandings of food production. Um, I spent a lot of time in the homes and gardens of women and men who were subsistence farmers, community gardeners, as well as in the offices of agricultural scientists and um, in sort of in various sort of academic settings in the country. At that time to understand how um, traditional as well as sort of highly technical approaches to food production were, um, were being done in the way that traditional practices were being affected by newer, more efficient methods that were being promoted by the government and, and certainly by Western corporations, which were seizing the opportunity to move into this new South Africa. Over this time, I was living in, uh, in a Rondavel, a very deep in a rural community in um, the sort of Northeast part of KwaZulu Natal, it's called Klebisa. Um, and there I had sort of the front row seat to see how the implementation of a national program that was called Poshinlala or Squash Out Hunger was being implemented. So this was again, government program, New South Africa and about addressing these like, addressing poverty and, and malnutrition. And what I saw was how this program is encouraging people to grow foods that they were not familiar with. They were, um, being you know, introduced to the marvels of chemical pesticides and um, expensive hybrid seeds. I saw how people would discard the foods they were growing after having sort of these fantastic celebrations when the government you know, trucks would come in and there would be celebrations and parades with these wonderful vegetables and so on. But as soon as the trucks would leave and night was falling, all of that food just was completely disposed of. And I had the opportunity to, to talk to people, you know, what's happening? And what I heard where they were complaining about these foods, they don't, they don't like the taste, they don't know how to prepare them. And, you know, most importantly, you know, unlike indigenous crops, they, these sort of seeds, these types of foods would not provide food year round. And so we have this cycle, feast and famine. I think, you know, this was now, I mean, it seems like so long ago, <coughs> in the nineties, I think, thankfully, I think some, Hopefully we're coming around, but I think we know these stories. We see these stories again and again. Meanwhile, another thing was happening in Flavisa, which was that HIV was spreading. Oh. It is a, um, I am just way too emotional about these things. <laughs> but every day was, uh, was, my every day was affected by HIV. Um, there was no treatment available as people were dying. Um, and it was like, I could see generations that were just disappearing. It was during that time, and I guess to go back, remember I'm doing my PhD in educational psychology. I was not in anything to do with, or I didn't think I was in anything to do with public health. I didn't know that the field of public health existed. And it was at that time that a good friend, of, well, now a good friend and, and colleague, um, Mark Lurie, said to me, I think you would really enjoy studying epidemiology. And I tried to look really cool as if I knew what that was. I kind of wrote it down. <laughs> and later I looked it up. And I was like, that sounds interesting. So um, I guess, you know, there's a lot of things that happened between sort of having the beer with Mark Lurie and learning this word epidemiology and then what happened afterwards. But, um, but you might kind of see why my educational journey has was somewhat extended beyond that first PhD. So now, now my work focuses most broadly um, on the development, implementation, and evaluation of interventions that address factors that contribute to pervasive inequalities in healthcare access and health outcomes globally. My work touches on a few areas, including HIV, uh, prevention, care, and treatment, HIV-associated malignancies, 
maternal, newborn, and child health, and as well as issues related to vaccine hesitancy and vac vaccine preventable diseases. This is a sort of newer area to me over the last year or so. Um, I can't, it's not really meant for sort of seeing, but just to try to show over time, I've led and co-led projects with populations across the lifespan, most of which have been in countries in Southern and East Africa. Um, and you know, across all of them, they is a concern around issues related to health equity, which really drives all of my work. Um, so these names are just all the various studies, which uh, now provide data for anyone that would like to come and help with writing some papers. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, most of my work is intervention focused, um, including development of interventions, as well as implementing and evaluating them. I use qualitative and quantitative methods, um, most recently learning about and implementing discrete choice experiments or DCEs. I take or try to take a holistic approach to everything that I do, considering ways that individual interpersonal, community, and environmental influences, influences behavior and health outcomes. And um, I incorporate mobile technology into much of my work for purposes of data collection, which I think is now extremely standard, um, but also um, for use as part of the interventions themselves, which that will be for a future talk, but um, you can use technology to support sort of mental health interventions. Um, where I can, I'd love to incorporate the use of media, video animation, photography, comics, radio, um, which I have used for different purposes um, for engaging communities, um, as well as, as part of interventions, and of course for um, use for dissemination purposes. And um, as you come to know me, you will, you'll, I'm sure we'll learn that sort of, if I could do sort of anything else, it would be to be a photographer and filmmaker. So I think I'm not going to pursue another degree or anything, but um, but where I can, I really like to, to incorporate these other things that I love to do. Um, and finally, you know, I, I think it's a the hallmark of, you know, really everything they do is using participatory design, transdisciplinary collaboration, multi-sectoral partnerships, um, finding all the possible ways of engaging with the community, trying to learn what we do wrong and trying to respond to it. And, and then, you know, of course, you know, throughout is about capacity strengthening for students here and uh, elsewhere in the world. Okay. So with all of that, I'll turn to food security. So a little background, I'm sure everybody is aware of food security. Insecurity is a major global issue. Uh, according to uh, data provided by the World Food Program, in 2021, there were an estimated 828 million people who are chronically hungry, uh, which means that people are not able to meet their food consumption requirements in the long term, which is also known as undernourishment. There are also an estimated 193 million people who experience acute hunger in 53 countries. Acute hunger means that people are not able to meet food consumption requirements in the short term, often due to sporadic crises, which is, could be related to climate conflict, pandemics, so on. Um, over 80% of the population who are most at risk are, are live in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. But of course, there are people everywhere, including in Kingston, including on this campus that experience food insecurity. Um, just in, in different ways. With respect to climate change, there are, these are some of the mechanisms that underlying reduced food availability, including droughts, excessive rainfall, increased temperatures, changes and changes to the entire ecosystem, such as um, now increased numbers of pests, types of pests, um, increased plant disease, um, as well as effects on animals. Um, yeah, and of course, I mean, one 
another huge effect of climate change now is just that it's shifting our the growing seasons. And that is in itself having so many effects on people's lives. People who, for example, um, would traditionally shift from farming to mining in different seasons. Now with the overlapping seasons, they can't do one or the other. And it's, it just has this incredible ripple effect. Meanwhile, there's also HIV. So where there are high levels of HIV, we generally also see high levels of food insecurity. Food insecurity is a driver of adverse HIV outcomes, HIV related outcomes, and it's also a driver of food insecurity. These pathways, this is very kind of simply illustrated here, but we see that individuals who are unwell have you know, an increased likelihood of having reduced productivity and um, subsequently reduced household income, leading to household food insecurity, <clears throat> reduced diet, dietary diversity, quality and quantity of food, and leading to nutritional deficiencies and undernutrition, which we can return that cycle, which only makes all of the HIV-related outcomes um, all the more difficult. And yeah, I'll say this, I, if I'm right, is, does anybody here do work in HIV? I've been more, <laughs> and with other things, or so cancer, I think is more common, the, yeah. And so, and probably chronic disease, non-communicable diseases. So, you know, I'm, as much as I'm talking about HIV, I mean, now, you know, we're, we're now always talking about the overlap of HIV and non-communicable diseases and so on. And I'm sure we can sort of expand you know, these kinds of um, uh, sort of, you know, conceptual frameworks to, um, to illustrate the impacts on, on other endpoints. Okay, so now, I'm going to shift to talking about one study, or a study that has really extended over, I mean, sort of in various ways over the past decade. Um, so Shamba Maisha. Shamba Maisha is a, um, it's a, a study that includes sort of, um, sort of multiple teams. I've led, um, projects that have focused on children and my colleagues, um, Sherry Weiser, Craig Cohen, who are at UCSF, have led um, Shamba Maisha studies that have focused on adults. Um, we are sort of separate, but we're also together. And so I, I won't, anyway, I'll, you'll sort of see that in a moment. And uh, I'll say we're, we're very much sort of, we've just been doing analyses. We have one paper that's out pediatric one is coming, and a lot of analyses are sort of ongoing, so some of this is a bit... How am I for time? I'm not quite seeing. Or is this correct? But that's correct. We tried to do that by 120. If there's going to be time for questions, it's fine. Great. Um, so Shamba Maisha. Um, Shamba Maisha means farming is life in Kiswahili. Um, the name and the logo were the products of engaging with community members and they came up with the picture and the name and so on. Um, very broadly, this intervention is um, targets poverty and agriculture for ag adults living with HIV. And it had three components, which are one, there was a microfinance component, which is a small loan that was meant for um, them to use to buy seeds and other um, things that they might need for their for gardening. Um, it included the provision of a hand-powered water pump, which is um, this, a water pump that is uh, produced by a nonprofit group that is in Western Kenya um, that um, has been, you know, basically found to be sort of used usable by men and women um, and then um, and then of course agriculture and finance training which was provided also by a local 
NGO over the course of um, six sessions with the adults. I'm going to briefly talk about the objectives of the adult study. So first, for the adult study, and it really all starts with the adult study. The objective of the adult study of the study was to determine the effect of Shamba Maisha, the intervention on viral load suppression, household food insecurity, antiretroviral medication adherence, clinic attendance, depression, self-confidence, and social support. For the pediatric study, um, I was following um, the children in the households. So there's the HIV affected households. And our objectives were to determine the effect of the intervention on um, nutritional health and neurodevelopmental, neuro neurobehavioral development outcomes amongst HIV affected children under five years old. And so to be clear, these are not all children who are living with HIV. They're children who would really be a mix of kids, some who, a few who were infected with HIV, um, many who were exposed to HIV perinatally, and then many who were HIV negative and not exposed to HIV. So they're children in these households. The study was um, done in the Anza region, which is in the western part of Kenya. We used a cluster randomized controlled trial design, including 16 health facilities that were randomized um, to intervention or control versus control arms. Um, I should say, you know, this study was, um, the geographic area covered was really very, very large. So it would take a easily four hours, five hours to drive sort of from, you know, one part to another. Um, and the, this work was preceded by quite a lot of mapping work and other work looking at soil and rainfall and so on to determine, um, you know, sort of the, the clusters. Um, the participants for the adult study included um, those who are 18 years and older living with HIV, meaning they're infected with HIV, on antiretroviral therapy for at least six months, and who were moderately to, to, um, to severely food insecure, um, and who had access to arable land and surface water. So um, I just, I'll sort of like point this out here. So these are people really rural part of Africa, they, and they have access to large bits of land, right? So um, well, at the end, I'll come back to that point. But, um, but these folks represent a lot of people who live in, you know, throughout countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then for children, we enrolled children who are six to 36 months and their primary caregiver from the participating households. We, um, both studies collected data every six months, so over 24 months, and I've already talked about the outcomes. This is a conceptual framework guiding the pediatric study. And so uh, on the left, you see um, the intervention components, and we you know, posited that this intervention would have an effect on household wealth and household food security. The idea is that they're producing food both for their own consumption as well as for sale. Um, we hypothesize that food insecurity or food security, improved food security would affect caregiver physical health status, their mental health status, um, caregiver empowerment, and then um, behavioral outcomes, which would be infant and child feeding, healthcare utilization for their child, and um, child care related health behaviors. And then our primary outcomes were illness and infection and um, somatic growth. Um, and then secondary outcomes were um, neurobehavioral development. We use intention to treat analyses. 
Um, analysis was stratified by age at enrollment, um, meaning that um, children who were younger were those who were six to 24 months and those who were older were age 24 months or older. So um, we use mixed effects models with facilities and children as random effects while steady arm and, and time were, um, were analyzed as fixed effects. And then linear contrast statements were used to estimate the trend across the 24 months or the whole study period for the intervention comparison arm. And then we looked at the difference between arms and trend. So over the 24 months. All right, how are you? Outcomes that I will, first these are just a measure. So um, first we looked at um, most importantly somatic growth. So this is linked. Um, length and height for age, weight for age, BMI for age, Z score, uh, weight for length for height, Z scores, as well as child diet, um, and on sort of a number of ways. I'm not going to talk so much about the dietary outcomes. And then we also looked at health outcomes, um, diarrhea, cough, fever, care seeking, and then um, development outcomes. I guess I might say here, you know, the, our data were collected over um, a pretty complex study to implement. So as I said, this was done over a very large geographic area. We had a team of uh, about 27 research assistants who, um, as part of the study, we trained to ride motorcycles. So we put onto the roads of Kenya the first, we think, the first cadre of female motorcycle my motorcyclists, and over the two-year period, we had no accidents by the women. <laughs> Up with the guys ended up in rivers and so on. But no, we had, I mean, nothing, nothing terrible happened. Um, and what else can I say? I guess the other parts, so some of, some of our data were collected in clinics, and then, and other parts of data were collected in households. Um, so, all of that brings a bit of complexity. This is our consort flow chart. And I think the only thing I'll say about this is that from, there were 720 households in the adult study. And we enrolled 372 children and their primary caregiver from amongst those households. They were randomized, allocated to intervention or control group and some, uh, some people were lost to follow up and um, it, you know, these were families. We were able to ascertain where they went. They went, typically moved away from the area to go into um, the city for work into Nairobi. Um, and then, and there were um, a few deaths not related to the project. The deaths were related to um, typically traffic accidents and malaria. And then um, about 90% of our participants were um, included in analysis at Endline. Like, I don't really want to go into this. These are just our participant characteristics. Um, you know, mean age of months uh, for the children were um, very similar um, at about 20, 21 months. Um, pretty well balanced by sex. Um, <coughs> And, I, and quite well balanced across other, um, other measures uh, related to food security, water insecurity, um, as well as the anthropometric measurements. As I said, we also did I mean, quite a um, tedious data collection related to child's diet. Um, has anybody here who does nutrition work? food frequency. So this is a questionnaire that is, um, they're extremely long and they're uh, it's asking about, um, you know, in the last two weeks, has the child had, you know, has the child had beans, whatever. Um, anyway, this is very common. I would, I would love to work with somebody who is really into nutrition and dietary data collection. Um, this is certainly not my area of expertise. Um, <coughs> they are really confusing, but nonetheless, we did it. We learned a lot about what people are eating. 
Um, and then we, um, we also use a few different measures of child um, neurobehavioral development. And it's like quite well balanced. I'm not going to actually kind of go through just a few things in these slides. Um, so for our, I'll just jump to this one. The first thing we look at is, um, where is my thing? Length and height for the younger children. And we see, I mean, so for, for length and height, <laughs> that blue is a control group, red is intervention. When we look at the difference and differences over time, the intervention group um, has better growth over the 24 month period than the control group. And ultimately, after all of that work, that really is like the great finding. So the, um, Children and the, the younger children who are enrolled at the younger age in the intervention group grew, I think it's on average, a, I think it's approximately a centimeter, which sounds very small, but is a, a, a significant high growth. Um, we did not see differences in weight, and we also did not see, um, sorry, the difference in trend for the intervention group was, I mean, for BMI was um, significant, but sort of in what you would see in the wrong direction. What we think is happening is that our <coughs> children are getting taller and lighter. So it's sort of feels counterintuitive. This is just sort of the data for that. Like the height for the older children. And um, here we see that for, we don't, we basically we don't see differences between the intervention control group for weight for length. I will just sort of blaze through these because there's nothing else stands out. For diet, as I said, we learned a lot about what children are eating, but, but data really do not make much sense. Um, we see, for example, um, that we, what we think might be happening is that, um, that folks who are in the intervention arm were, no, how do I want to say this? One of the key parts of the components of this intervention was the inclusion of a, this microfinance component, and they were expected to pay the loan back. That's a whole discussion in itself. <laughs> And um, I mean, the, the um, people really struggled to pay it back and many didn't. Um, what we think might be happening is that end line is about the time that they were really being pushed to pay it back. Um, so this is all, it's quite controversial about how to handle this. Um, and we suspect that some of the, inter some of the families were probably struggling a bit at the end line, which was the very time that we're also trying to capture some changes in the diet. So people might've been putting more of their money towards paying that loan back versus food in the house, which was certainly not the intention. Um, yeah, so I just want to sort of, we have a lot of data about food, but I don't want to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. In terms of other analyses, one uh, major thing that happened in 2018 is there were massive rains and people lost, in particular areas, lost their fields. Like, so they described like entire uh, gardens just slipping off the side of the mountain, like losing absolutely everything. And in some cases, their parts of their home and so on. And so um, we have done some other analyses where we've you know, sort of taken into account what's happening in those, um, you know, excluding facilities that experienced weather events. And, you know, in summary, what we find is that, you know, for the somatic or the growth outcomes, we see a strong effect in length and height. 
for um, younger children, the intervention arm, um, similar for weight, similar for BMI. For diet outcomes, um, you know, they were very similar between the groups in terms of dietary frequency, composition, diet composition, grains, and so on. Um, for older children, they were, um, we see no difference between, um, in terms of somatic outcomes as in diet outcomes. But most importantly, it did have an effect on, on length and height. Um, in some ways, it was so disappointing to me to have sort of only this finding. However, um, I think it was what's really important about it is it shows that um, in this intervention, which did not include any component that was directly focused on children, had an effect on children, which suggests that, you know, if we were to include some, you know, components that, you know, which would be about supporting caregivers around foods that, um, appropriate foods for children, what to feed children and so on, um, you know, could sort of boost that, that effect. Um, we also, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I want to jump to the end. So many people were involved um, in Kenya and in, in the US. And I didn't make a slide for it, but just about sort of what's coming next. Um, right now, we are, I mean, there's still quite a lot of analyses happening from both the adult and the pediatric study. Um, but we're also um, have a couple of grants that are under review. Um, where we're sort of extending, you know, that idea and sort of reshaping the way the foods, the way the intervention itself is designed. One important thing is removing the, the loan part of it. Um, so we have one grant under review, which focuses um, more on women who are pregnant and families, and then, um, and another that is, um, that will sort of bring these, the intervention to um, schools and school gardens. And, you know, it's quite a different shape of, of this kind of intervention. But, you know, overall, we've, I mean, we've done quite a lot of, um, you know, sort of post-study post community engagement and, you know, listen to folks from, you know, locally and from government about, you know, where, where they would like to go. And so, um, you know, we will pursue this, but in, in sort of some different shapes. I'm quite interested in um, how do we address food security in space constrained space places. And so, like I pointed out earlier, this was all done in places where people have access to a lot of land. But there is, um, and globally, there is a you know, a tremendous move of people into cities. And, you know, one problem with cities is that it is quite space constrained, it's harder to produce food. Um, and it's a, you know, this movement towards cities is something that is, is only going to grow over the next decades. And it is very much related to climate change and um, as well as conflict and, and other things. So I would like to, try to think in very innovative ways, but what can we do to sort of green our cities, help to feed folks in cities, and to, you know, also to really harness the talents of the people who are coming from rural areas in the cities when we think about growing food. Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that, so. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, Dr. Butler, do you want to field your own questions? Um, yeah, several hands up. Yeah, so I just wanted to get your opinion on how governments and NGOs can work together to ensure that interventions address food insecurity that are um, sustainable and effective in the long term. Yeah, thank you. You know, I think 
I think sort of the first part of that is bringing people around the table and talking about the issues. Um, you know, I think one of the, um, I've recently been involved in kind of a global evaluation of social protection interventions, which of which like food, food aid, food production, and so on is part of social protection. And one thing that we hear over and over again is how um, the work of, let's say, um, UN agencies or international organizations are not, not, not really aligned with the sort of needs and priorities of governments and communities. Um, there's a tremendous desire in countries to, um, to be able to lead, you know, to identify the priorities and to be able to address them together. So, you know, I think, you know, towards anything that is sustainable and, and surely more effective is that we just, we have to find better ways of supporting those kinds of interactions and, you know, rather than the North always coming in with the answers. So. Hi, Dr. Butler. Um, thank you for your talk. It's really exciting to have you join our department. Um, much of Sub-Saharan Africa is experiencing a population boom. And I'm just curious how this has impacted some of your research or work with interventions. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, directly, I mean, that's absolutely true. Um, I'd say, I mean, sort of in my work, it, it, it probably more see it in studies I do with adolescents. And so we've seen, I mean, especially over the last couple of years, an incredible spike in um, adolescent pregnancies. Mm -hmm. And and it's in every, every country I work in talks about this and that it's really a priority issue. So I'm sure, I mean, this is, I'm sure magnified at a, a national level. Um, you know, I think how, I guess that, you know, otherwise, I think I'm thinking about these issues probably as much as you are and um, thinking about how, what kind, what are the, what are the next kind of interventions that will be appropriate for this growing population, especially when at the same time we have, um, again, globally, we see this like sort of mobility or migration away from rural areas, away from food production into cities. Young people don't want to farm. And that's, um, it's a problem for countries. And so I certainly don't have the answers, but. Hi, great talk. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned with the intervention that you would like to change the loan component in the future and have it perhaps just be providing like a baseline income for a certain set amount of time or something along those lines maybe? I think there's so many different ways of, of so many ways of doing that part differently. Um, so um, I'll say I was not involved in that decision and uh, it doesn't matter who was involved but um, you know, I think that we have, you know, so many great examples of how loans are done really well from examples in India and other settings. You know, I think, um, you know, I think a big problem that I will say that what we could see is that, you know, these loans were provided to people. They were not, um, there was not sort of the buy-in of people. There was not the accountability. Um, to people which we would see and, you know, I work with partners in South Africa where they um, have used like a really successful model that's more of a, um, it's called a stock bell, but it's like a, um, I think it's, it's called different things in different places, but it's like small groups of people who come together for a common reason. So they're all mothers or they're all grandmothers or they want to come together to learn a particular skill. And then as part of that group, you introduce the idea about savings and it will start with really, really small savings. So people might, everybody might put in the equivalent of, you know, 25 cents or something really small. And, you know, each week that they meet, you might put in a little bit more and then when somebody in the group needs it, then they would take the loan. But the big difference is that then they're accountable to their peers. 
and um, you know, and they're sort of when these things are supported well, it's like there's a kind of a common desire to to do well, right? To do well together. So I mean, I think that's a model. Fully eliminating the whole thing is another model, but you know, there is you know the other real part of this is how do you fund these kinds of interventions if you want to scale them and make them sustainable and so on. Were you happy with the, uh, the way the other two components of the intervention went, the handheld pump and the education? Yeah, I think the training, the training part went very well. I mean, that was done by uh, all by local organizations who knew the communities, knew, you know, they were just really embedded in the communities. That went very, very well. Um, the handheld pump, I would say, also went well. There have been improvements. So we've, I mean, we observed issues with the pump, which have subsequently been been fixed. And so, for example, some, you know, we did at the, of course, at Inland, we did, of course, put qualitative piece to just understand, you know, people's experience in the study. And, um, and I mean, one thing we know is that for some people, the pump still, for women, are, they were still kind of hard to use. Um, in some cases, that didn't matter because, you know, the way people would organize themselves. So even though the study was, was directed at one person in the family, the way many families would actually take on this intervention was as a family. Future directions for this kind of thing, I think really could sort of harness the idea of, you know, working with families instead of targeting individuals. Um, and so different families would, you know, sometimes they would, even though, let's say the woman was the prime, the, the index participant, her and her husband or her and her son or somebody would work together so that she would do more of the planting and he would do the watering. But that was sort of locally negotiated. So. As you know, say uh, maybe a last thing that, you know, one of the things that does not come out in any way in quantitative data, but are the ways that this intervention transformed many families. And we, you know, I saw it in site visits and we see it in the qualitative data. And so the kind of story, um, I just, I mean, I, this was a family that I got to meet and, you know, hear the stellar story, which was this, it was a, um, they were engaged in the intervention. It led to, I mean, an incredible, um, you know, an increase in the crops that they were growing, and followed by um, increased amount, like money, coming into the household. The um, I talked to them about, you know, so what did that do for you, right? And so I think in our data we kind of look at it as like, oh, you use money to buy more food or whatever, but they talked about. The first, or one of the things they did is that they bought cell phones. And at first, like I didn't, I kind of thought, oh, that's too bad. Um, <laughs> but what they described was how, what, um, what it did for them is how, number one, husband and wife can now talk to each other. So when one of them is in town selling or wherever, they could talk to each other. They were, these were like older couple and they were giddy. They fell in love again, they said. We fell in love again because of these phones. It improved the relationship. Um, and it also, I mean, had this other benefit. He, the husband talked about how now he wouldn't fear for the safety of his wife when she was away because they could stay in touch. Um, they also, you know, used, you know, took me into the room and showed me like their um, electric piano. I was like, oh, again, more stuff. And, um, but then they talked about this piano. So with the, you know, keyboard, it's like a Casio kind of thing. And so with this keyboard, they now could take it to the church. And so they provided, they did, the, they were able to, you know, provide music at their church, which um, was it like raised their social, the way they're viewed by, by the community, their standing in the community. Um, and I mean, that kind of thing just goes on and on. And of course they point to things like a solar panel and which now the children are able to study after dark and other improvements which change the way cooking was done, which improves um, like exposure to uh, cooking, you know, smoke and so on. 
So there are just so many ways that these interventions can impact families, um, which really are not captured in, sorry, the data section that we did it, right? Um, but, you know, I think it's, I think it's all of those kinds of impacts which keep bringing me back to food. I, what I showed you earlier, I do lots of other things. Um, and I'm sort of always kind of struggling with the thing of, you know, that I am kind of like spread out too much. Um, and now that I'm here, it's a new opportunity to say, what am I going to focus on? <laughs> and, you know, part of that discussion with myself has been, um, it's, it's like landing right, it's like back at the part, the place where I started. Weirdly, I started with food before I even knew about public health. And then I kind of wandered away and I got involved in um, work with uh, HIV associated malignancies and um, human herpes virus 8. I learned lots about what happens in the lab and that was an incredible experience. Um, but, you know, even, even that led me to see sort of other ways that, again, food, food security and nutrition has an impact on, you know, outcomes for people living with cancer. So, yeah. In the interest of time, let's take one more question from Dr. Davis on the blog phone, please. I, I don't want to hold up people. I just wanted to say welcome, Lisa. It's so great. And um, we have, we've had a chance to chat, but I was really uh, just so thrilled to have another global health person and an interventionist and an epidemiologist who's doing like really applied work globally. It's such a great contribution to our, to our, you know, our faculty and our department. And I'm just so, so, so happy to have you here. Um, I'm wondering if you could just sort of tell the people in the room and online what your um, what how you how you'll engage with students. So will you be teaching? Will you be supervising students in these projects? Or like how will that work? Yeah, sure. So um, I I will be teaching um, unless I'm here otherwise in January <laughs> next year. Um, but you know otherwise I would I mean. I have a list of projects that really students can step in at many sort of places to do, you know, a range of things that doesn't involve travel and that can be done in sort of bite-sized bits, um, both qualitative and quantitative uh, work. And, and, and again, sort of on a, a wide range of topics. Um, so I welcome, you to find me. I guess everyone has a way to find. I'm in the email list, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I would love the opportunity if you want to just write to me and make a time to come see me. I will. I will be here um, on campus for at least a few days, at least every other week, and then sort of a scattering of days and sort of other weeks. And then, of course, always Zoom available. So, yeah, I look forward to that. You know, I guess. Other thing, I mean, we'll think about this in the future, but I, you know, I will be applying for more grants and, you know, I really want to be able to create opportunities for people to engage with these projects in the settings where we're doing the work. Um, so if that's an interest, um, I'd love to talk to you and I'm learning about these new grants and so on. So we'll figure it out. I'm sure you guys will teach me an awful lot along the way. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Butler. I just have to make a final announcement. I want to thank everyone for coming to our Public Health Sciences Seminar Series throughout the year. Uh, and um, uh, Nikki will be sending out a survey soon uh, uh, to uh, ask about uh, uh, which ones you enjoyed, which ones you attended, and suggestions for, uh, for uh, future uh, speakers for next year. So um, thanks very much. This closes out our season, our 2022-2023 uh, uh, season. Uh, it doesn't seem like this semester is almost over, but it was, uh, uh, it's been a very, very exciting year. So thank you, Dr. Butler. <laughs>